Hello everyone. Alright, so we've made our sprite characters. We've got our prefabs and our art assets in the right place, and I assume you've got all your characters ready to go. So let's go ahead and get started by making our characters enter the scene and spawn them on the screen. Okay, so we've got our base character class here. Let's go ahead and open that up. And let's also go into our character types and come into the character sprite asset, because we're going to be working in here as well. Now let's think about this for a second before we get started. We have four different types of characters, three of which are going to need to enter and exit the scene. We know that. The other one, the text characters, no assets, no, no art, no graphics, so obviously they don't need to enter or exit. So this logic is going to be something that is called on most characters, but not all. So for me, I'm going to make the functions available to the base character class. But when it applies to the text character, it's not going to do anything. So we'll be overriding these functions for each character, and this will go for revealing, for setting expressions, and for moving on the screen, and whatever else that graphical characters will do versus non-graphical. Now this entrance is going to be a coroutine, just like we did for say, we want it to run over time. And we're going to make two functions for that. We're going to make our public, make it virtual so that way we can override it for the inheriting classes, and make it return a coroutine so that way we can get the loop and know when it's done. First one we're going to call is show. This is going to reveal the character. And the second one we're going to call is public virtual coroutine hide. This is going to remove them from view. It's not going to destroy them from the scene, but just hide them so we don't see them anymore. Now, we need to know since this is looping logic, we need to know if we're already showing or if we're already hiding, and we need to make sure we cancel it out and go ahead and perform the appropriate logic. Now that logic is going to run in a I enumerator. So once again, we'll make a public virtual I enumerator and call this showing or hiding. They're basically the same. We're altering the alpha on each one of them, so the only difference between show and hide is what that alpha value is going to be. One will be for fully opaque, and one will be for fully transparent. That's one and zero. So it wouldn't make sense to make two different I enumerators, so they'll share the same function, but they're going to have two different references to the actual coroutines. Let's come back up top to our variables, and let's give some references to the coroutines so that way our characters can keep track of what they're doing. Now, I don't want the references to these coroutines to be public, but I also need the inheriting classes to have access to them. Therefore, we need to make them protected. So we'll say protected, and this is going to be of the coroutine type. We're going to need two for revealing and hiding. So we make sure we can call, end, and do whatever to the appropriate one. So I'm going to keep a naming convention for the variable, starting with CO for a coroutine, and call this revealing and then CO hiding. Okay, so those are the two coroutines. Now let's make some publicly accessible booleans that tell us whether they are active or not. Public bool is revealing will equal CO revealing not equal to null. So we know if they're revealing or not, then public bool is hiding is if CO hiding is not equal to null. And then maybe on top of that, I'll also want a boolean to know if the character is actually visible in the scene or not. So public virtual, because this isn't going to be true for text characters, no matter what. A character doesn't have a canvas group, they don't even have a root. So we'll make a public virtual boolean called is visible, and just set that to false. We'll override it for the sprite characters. Okay, so we've got our coroutines here. So now when we go to try to show something or hide something, I'm going to populate it in here because this is going to be a logic that's accessed on the three different character types. But this logic is going to be empty because we'll need to make this different for each different character type. Live2D is going to use a, a, its own method, and 3D model especially is going to have its own method to show or hide. So this can be blank. And I will just set this to a debug.log and I'll say that show and hide cannot be called from a base character type and then return null. Actually yield return null because it's a I enumerator. Now my I enumerator is underlined red which is 
odd. But it says that uh, it thinks I'm using system.collections.generic.ienumerator. And that would be because, up in the namespaces, collections generic is being used. Why is that? What's using that? Ah, yes, the lists are using it. So I need to include using system.collections, and that's it. Because both of these have their own ienumerator type, which is not uh, not very friendly for when you're typing that out. But there we go. We see it corrects because now it knows that this is a system collections ienumerator, not a system.collections.generic. Okay, so what goes in show and hide? Let's go ahead and check if we are revealing and if we're hiding right now. For show, if is revealing, then we don't need to do anything. Return return co revealing because we've already got some type of instance running and likewise for hide if is hiding then just go ahead and return co hiding because we've already got a process rolling now however if is hiding then we need to stop the process that is running that and with this being a character type, which is not a mono behavior, we're going to run all of the logic for these characters off of the character manager. At this point, the character manager is something that I'm going to reference quite frequently for characters, so I'll just make a shortcut for it up above. Right above the dialog system, we'll also do detected character manager manager and point that to the character manager dot instance. Protected because I don't need anything outside accessing the manager of the character. We already know that's going to be the character manager. Okay, so if we're hiding when we're trying to show, let's make sure that we tell our manager to stop the coroutine. What coroutine do we want to stop? The CO hiding coroutine. And at this point, we know we're good, so now we can say that co revealing equals manager dot start coroutine, and this will be showing or hiding. So, how do we tell whether we are showing or hiding? Let's just throw in a boolean for show. Are we showing? Yes, we are. Okay, and now return co revealing. Same thing for the um, for the hide here. Let's just copy and paste that and change this to is revealing. If we are, then we stop the revealing coroutine and set our CO hiding to show or hide, but set show to false and then return CO hiding. And that's our basic show and hide command. For a text character, this will do nothing because we don't have anything in showing and hiding. But for sprite characters, we'll be able to override it. So, how are we going to do this? If we look back at our constructor, when a character is created, and if we look at our sprite character, the only thing that we're getting is the name and the configuration. So, our root is not actually being assigned anything. Up above, it is null. So, our root is not going to be able to fade in because we don't have one yet. We need to assign it, and that means we need to get the prefab for the character. That prefab is going to be fetched for us in the character manager when we get the configuration information for each specific character. We see we get the name of the character, and then we get the config of the character. Well, here we also need to try to get the prefab of the character if it's an appropriate type. So we need to make sure that we're able to store that in our character information. So we have the name, we got the config. Let's go ahead and make a public game object for the prefab as well. Okay, and when we get our character info, we should say that our result.prefab equals uh, get prefab for character and this would be something that will take in the character name okay so we need to generate this function let's make private game object and then reference this I'm sure there's a shortcut for that I need to look that up because uh, I do not know that off the top of my head or creating these functions and methods uh, automatically when they're not referenced I'm sure there's one there um, okay, so make character name, 
And this is how we're going to grab the character. We need to get the path of the character. We need to get the path in resources and then load the game object at that resources path. And since this is going to be the same for all the characters, this is a good time to make a constant field. So let's come up above and go ahead and do just that. Okay, so we're going to need three different fields here at least. We want one for the root path of the character, where they're located within resources. We know that's the character's folder, followed by whatever the name of the character is. And then we need a prefab path, which would just be the root path of the character, plus the name of the prefab. And both of these, the root folder and the prefab name, are going to contain the character name. And I think it would be easy if we use a injection feature here, the, the string formatting, rather. So if we know our character name, then we can just inject it into the path that we need, and we get the root path, and we get the prefab path. Uh, what I mean is, let's go ahead and start by defining whatever kind of tag is going to represent the character name in these fields. A constant string, and this will be the character name ID. And I'm just going to set this to alligator brackets followed by character name. This is just an ID so that way I can inject the name into the root path and to the prefab name. So let's define a string for the root path of the character. Let's make this a private string and make it character root path and set that equal to this string right here. It's going to be inside of the resources, we know that, and it's the characters folder. So characters followed by an open bracket. And then let's go ahead and inject the character name ID. And this essentially tells us if we're looking for the root path of Stella, it's characters, inject Stella for character name, so we get characters Stella. Simple as that. And now the prefab name. Let's go ahead and do a private string for the character prefab path, and this is going to be equal to this. We're going to start with the character root path, and then inside of the root path, we're going to do a forward slash, and then the name of the prefab we're looking for, which we just said was character, followed by a dash, followed by brackets, and inside of the brackets was the character name, and that would be the character name ID, so we can inject it straight in there. So if we grab the prefab path, and inject the name of the character we're trying to load, we can go ahead and grab the character prefab and load it as and load it into the scene. Let's just make a quick little function to format the path for us. So let's make a private string and call this format character path. And we're going to take a string for the path and a string for the character name. What this function is going to do is it's going to return to us the path.replace, and we're going to replace the character name ID with the character name. That's it. Okay, so now let's go ahead and load the prefab. So string prefab path equals format character path, and we're going to format the prefab path, which is we defined up above, and we're going to inject the character name that we're working with. And then we'll load it from resources and return whatever we loaded. So return resources.load, and we're going to load it as a game object. What we're going to load is simply the object at our prefab path. And so when we get our character info, we also get the prefab. And so now we can pass that into the characters that we're creating. And so in create character from info, first of all, you can see that I put in the switch case here. Uh, instead of all those if statements I had, I have no idea what I was smoking, but it didn't even taste good, I'll tell you that much. So we have our characters, we can go ahead and just make an extra parameter to go ahead and take in the prefab along with the config. So let's head back to our character class. And when we create our constructor, let's also add here a game object for the prefab. 
and then then we can go ahead and spawn it if it's if we've passed one in so if prefab is not equal to null then let's go ahead and try to spawn it in the scene let's say game object ob equals object dot instantiate and we're going to instantiate the prefab and we're going to parent it to a certain panel on the character manager which we don't have yet so let's head back in here real quick and let's create one i'm going to define this as a private make it a rect transform so we force this to be an object on the ui and just call it underscore character panel set that to null right now and then i'll make a public retriever that gets that value for us so rect transform character panel and set that to provide us the character panel and then we'll just go ahead and serialize this field so we can add it from the inspector inside unity let's go open our managers grab the character manager and then go ahead and assign our character panel to this one in the layers for our main canvas okay and now we can define that panel here so we can say manager dot character panel so that's what we're going to parent our object to when we instantiate it in the scene let's go ahead and make sure that our object is active in the scene let's go ahead and set it to active in case we saved the prefab while it was uh, disabled so we want it to be active in the scene because we need to grab some components from it we need to assign our root now now that we have an object let's go ahead and say that root equals ob.get component rect transform and now we have our root and while we're at it let's go ahead and grab the animator that we said we were going to place on the characters so we have no space for that up here or no variable rather so let's just make one say public animator animator and then animator can equal root dot get component in children animator and that's going to go ahead and grab the animator as the child of the root object. But if I recall correctly, I don't think I assigned an animator component to my prefabs. So if I go ahead and click on this right expand button here, that'll, allow, that'll take me right into the prefab editor. So under anim, I'm just going to go ahead and add a component animator. And then go out, that saves it. And go ahead and do the same thing for the other characters as well just so that way they've got their animators in place and we're all on the same page so when we create our character it's going to get our name get our configuration and it's going to assign the prefab and the root object in the scene if we have one so head back into character manager here and let's go down to the bottom for our character types here we are going to want to pass in the prefab as well but if we go and try to do that right now we obviously don't have a space for it because we need to define that in the classes for character text we have it trying to give the name and the configuration to base but the base is also expecting a prefab so let's just pass in null for the prefab since a text character will not use a prefab to elaborate on that, I'll go ahead and assign the identifier as well so we can see that the prefab is null. And for the character sprite, I need to add in the prefab here. Game object, prefab, and then throw in the prefab to the base, to the base character. Go back into character. Now, after config, let's also assign info.prefab. And cool, we'll get our sprite character. Live 2D, we need to do the same thing. So let's go ahead and assign a prefab and send the prefab to the base. And then pass in info.prefab. And lastly, for model 3D as well. Expect the base, then send base to the... Or send the prefab to the base character class. And then throw it in as the last parameter. And cool, this should get us 
everything that we need to spawn our sprite character in the scene. So when we create a character, it, we should see them pop up. Let's go ahead and try testing that. I'm going to take all these characters and just hide them in the scene with Control shift a And then let's go to our testing script. We have one for character testing, and let's make sure that we go ahead and try to create one. Um, let's get rid of all this stuff that we did from the last system, which was for our text characters. And let's go ahead and create a sprite character. So Stella is going to be created, and we should see her pop up on screen. When we run this logic, okay, yep, yeah, we can see that Stella is indeed brought into the scene, and we have uh, created a sprite character. I'm getting a null reference. What is that? Test characters, blah, blah, start coaching test. Oh, there's a... Yeah, I, I don't need that rolling, so that's that's nothing, nothing to worry about. But now I can go ahead and change Stella to female student 2. And interestingly for her, I do not get a prefab showing up on screen. Ooh, a text character, female student 2. Yeah, that would do it, wouldn't it? <laughs> Let's go into configuration and check out the character configs. This is why we need to add one for every character that we want to add to our scene. Because we need to define their type. There is no female student 2 because I haven't set her in the configuration. So if I add a new one and change from Benjamin to female student 2, let me go ahead and stop play mode. And I'll change that to FS2 for the alias. And I'm going to change her type to a sprite character. I'm not worried about the text right now. I'm just going to leave that. Actually, I am going to set that to the default colors. And also the font as well. Okay, and then I'm going to make a new one for Raylene. And Raylene is a sprite sheet character. And then lastly for the generic character. And set that to Jin. And that is a sprite sheet character as well. Okay, let's try that one more time with Female Student 2 configured in the configuration asset. And there we go. Now it pops her up because it knows what type to spawn her as. And if we run it for Raylene, then we get her showing up in the scene as well. So there we go. We have our characters entering the scenes and they are able to show up. We got their graphics and it's looking pretty good so far. And that means we can now come back into our character class and get our show and hide to do something. Now we're going to do this differently for each character. Text character is not going to do anything because they don't need to show or hide. The sprite character is going to use their canvas group. The live 2D characters will use their method and the 3D models will use their own. So we're going to override this on a per character type basis. So let's open up the sprite character and go ahead and make our override. We'll say public override and make this the showing or hiding I enumerator. And now we can define some logic to place in here. Let's go ahead and remove that uh, basic return. And I want to get a target alpha. So my float target alpha is going to equal, if we are showing, I want it to equal one. If we are not, I want it to be zero. So we fade in or out appropriately. And now I need to get the canvas group that's on our root object. So I'm going to say that canvas group equals, and if I need to reference this elsewhere, I'm just going to make a little variable up here for private canvas group and call this uh, root cg and just point that to root.git component canvas group and so my canvas group called self is going to equal root cg and now I can enter my loop and get our alpha to the right value. So while self or the root canvas group dot alpha is not equal to our target alpha, whatever that may be, we're going to go ahead and say that self dot alpha equals math f dot move towards. And we're going to move from where we currently are, which is the self dot alpha towards our target alpha by a speed like three multiplied by time dot delta time. And then go ahead and yield return null. 
Okay, and after we have exited this loop, that means we've reached our target alpha, we're either invisible or visible, and we can go ahead and clear out our coroutines by setting them equal to null. And this should show or hide a sprite character, for whoever we call it on. Let's go into test characters and just try that out real quick. I'm going to take, so I'm going to make a new character, say character Stella equals character manager dot instance dot create character Stella. And then how about I go ahead and yield return Stella dot hide because she should be coming in fully, fully transparent or fully opaque. So then I'll hide her and then yield return Stella dot show and then yield return Stella dot say hello. Okay, let's see how this runs. Before I do that, let me go ahead and remove Raylene so that way they're not layering on top of each other. Let me start that coroutine. And it's okay, so I could see she faded out and faded back in. That was a little quick. Before we get started on hiding, let's yield return new wait for seconds. Let's wait for one second and then yield return new wait for seconds 0 0.5. Wait for half a second. Okay, one, there she goes, and she faded back in. Cool. Now, what if I want a character to start invisible and then fade in when they come in the scene? For that, we could either come into the prefabs and then go ahead and set the alpha to zero and just save that the way it is, save that as the prefab, and then they'll automatically come in with a zero alpha. Or we could do it by script. When I create the new sprite character, I can also say root cg dot alpha equals zero and then maybe show to make the character fade in. Let's add a little delay here at the beginning too so we can see that in action. Okay, one, there you go, she fades in, fade out, and fade in. Cool. Okay, so they start invisible and then they fade in. But for my case and maybe for yours too, you may want a character to speak without actually showing up on the screen, even if they have a configuration. And you would want to control when they show up, not just when they're created. And so that's what I want to do. So I just want to make sure they start invisible and I'm going to remove show because I want to control that independently. So there we go. We can now make our characters fade in and fade out at will. So that's it for this episode. In the next one, we're going to work on character configuration casting. See you then.